reading from the beginning of the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of a priestly family in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to me thus, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. A prophet to the nations, I appointed you. Ah, Lord God, I said, I know not how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord answered me, say not, I am too young. To whomever, to whoever I send you, you shall go. Whatever I commend you, you shall speak. Have no fear before them, because I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord extended his hand and touched my mouth, saying, See, I place my words in your mouth. This day I set you over nations and over kingdoms to root up and to tear down, to destroy and to demolish, to build and to plant. Verbum da mini. I will sing of your salvation. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me and deliver me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, a stronghold to give me safety, for you are my rock and my fortress. O oh my God, rescue me from the hand of the wicked. I have the of salvation. For you are my hope, O oh Lord, my trust, O oh God, from my youth. On you I depend from birth. From my mother's womb, you are my strength. I have the of salvation. My mouth shall declare your justice day by day your salvation. O God, you have taught me from my youth until the present I proclaim your wondrous deeds. Dominus vobiscum, et sancti evangelii secundum Matthäum. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood along the shore. And he spoke to them at length in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground where it had little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and it withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit, a hundred or sixty or thirty-fold. Whoever has ears ought to hear. Verbum Domini.
Today we're beginning chapter 13 in Matthew's Gospel, and he gives uh, seven parables, and he opens up with this parable of the sower and the seed. The previous chapter, 12, we have a lot of conflict and kind of a harsh exchange uh, with Jesus and the Pharisees. In chapter 12, we're told that the Pharisees are hardened against him, that at the healing with the man of the withered hand, that we're told that the Pharisees, you know, told him you're not allowed to heal on the Sabbath, you can't do work on the Sabbath, and Jesus explains why and how the Sabbath was made for this. But we're told at the end of this exchange, but the Pharisees went out and took counsel against him to put him to death. So even after the explanation, they become more hardened, a clear explanation of what he's doing and why. They're more hardened against him, why, why he's doing the things he does, and they're rejecting that. And then we had this reading the other day where he talks about the quote from Isaiah that a bru the Messiah that will not crush the bruised reed, uh, the smoldering wick he will not quench, that he's going to deal with us uh, maintaining our freedom with mercy, with gentleness, you know, calling us to himself. They challenge him that, the, that he does these deeds by the power of Satan. And Jesus warns, again, warns them against blasphemy, against the Holy Spirit, this refusal of conversion, this refusal of, of metanoia to change, to repent. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that we're refusing his work in us. He speaks of a, a tree being known by its fruits. And then he calls them a brood of vipers, which is a pretty strong image. <laughs> I can't think of anything nastier than imagine falling into a, a nest of vipers. That's what he calls the Pharisees. So they're hardened against them. And then yesterday we had that teaching of this new family of Jesus, anyone who does the will of the Father is my mother, my brother, and my sister. Those are the disciples, those who are open and seeking the Lord's will, who have this change of heart, this metanoia, this repentance of turning from the former way of life and embracing the will of the Father and being brought into the communion of the church, the family of God, this new we that Jesus is forming through communion in him and with him. So disciples are entering into this. They have this opening to Jesus' message. So then we begin today this parable of the sower. And some of the seed, the seed is liberally, I love the whole scene, right? He's in Capernaum. Uh, you know, he leaves the house. He's staying at Peter's house. It's right there next to the Sea of Galilee waterfront property, we could say. <laughs> and uh, I was uh, talking to a lady the other day who lives in Laguna Beach, California. She's retired and has this beautiful house overlooking the Pacific Ocean. She showed me a picture of the blueness and it just seemed so, uh, uh, so peaceful. And, and this, I was just reading this the other day, you know, I think I mentioned this the other day, that this was along a trade route uh, for the, I think the Roman soldiers, there was a Roman camp in Magdala, and, but even further south, I think they had this commerce to the north that would pass through this area that would support, uh, give a market for the fish that they would catch out of the Sea of Galilee. So it's probably certainly a small town, but bustling with some activity. But he leaves the house, sits down at the beach, Many people come, so he gets in the boat, pulls offshore, sound travels well over the water, so he's able to speak to a lot of people. But just, to me, a very gentle scene, an inviting scene, like a 70s movie, you know, <laughs> kind of presenting the, 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 the teacher, you know, that we can come and, and enter into that. And I, I think that is contrast with our life today. You know, I was listening the other day to a, one of these, on the radio, one of these time management gurus, and, and he made a lot of sense. He was saying, you know, we need to think about our day and plan our day and just reflect. And it was so kind of fundamental. He said a lot of us, we don't take the time just to go an inch deeper 
and think about some of our goals and plans and what are we, what's really our priorities today. You know, we could be flooded by all this stuff, maybe answering emails or being torn this way and that, and we don't think to think about our priorities. And our culture can keep us in that tension when we're drenched with media and our smartphones. You know, this guy was, said, you know, even waiting in lines today, we pull out our smartphone and we're, we're, you know, we're looking at something, doing something. We have so few precious moments of reflection and maybe real thought. You know, we're just caught up in busyness. So Jesus tells this parable of the sower. And he, the sower liberally cast out this seed. And some of it falls on the footpath, some of it falls on rocky ground, some of it falls in thorns, some of it finds rich soil. But the sower almost seems unconcerned. He's just casting it out there. He's getting the word out there. It's a great image for us as Christians, you know, that our job is to, to put the message out there, to let the Holy Spirit work and convict hearts of conversion, of belief, of, you know, conversion to, to Christ and his message. So these different soils that are presented, the footpath where people walk, the soils harden, and it just lays there, it's exposed, and these birds come and eat it up. And I was thinking about this the other day, you're driving the road, you ever see those crows down here, they're always feeding on dead squirrels or something, <laughs> they are bold and strong. I mean, they wait to the last minute. To, sometimes I don't think they're gonna get out of the way of the car, you know? <laughs> and, and there's something very aggressive about them. And that's an image here of, of Satan. Jesus says the evil one comes and steals away that those who have heard without understanding, that's the footpath, and this bird comes down and consumes the seed. The rocky ground with little soil, a lack of roots, you know, this initial joy at receiving the word, uh, the roots aren't deep enough, the sun comes up, scorches it, and he compares this to when we enter trials or persecutions, that initial joy fades and we're frightened or scared or whatever, scandalized by something, and, we, and it, it doesn't bear fruit, right? It fails. And then he says, the seed that falls among the thorns is an image of the worldly anxieties and the lure of riches that choke the word. You know, those, those weeds, especially those ones with the briars and stuff, they always seem to grow faster than whatever we plant, you know? And it's a battle to try to keep them back. And he compares that to our worldly anxieties, the Lord of riches. Certainly, those of us in the West know this well, know this well, that all the stuff that we're presented, you know, the consumer materialistic culture that we live in, you got to have more, you got to do more. And uh, it's just this treadmill that keeps us busy and distracted. But there's rich soil, and the rich soil produces 160, you know, 30 fold yields, you know, for rich soil, that there's this, this great fruitfulness to the word. Jesus is the word. He's the word made flesh, the son of the father. And he is the sower here, casting out that seed. The word is his teaching, his person, the kingdom, the revelation of who God is, his plan of salvation for us. We call that in Matthew says in the next verses that these mysteries are revealed to you. It's the only time in the gospel there that he uses the word mystery. So God is a mystery. His plan of salvation is a mystery. Who he is in himself is a mystery. And these mysteries are known by revelation. They have to be revealed to us. They're gifts, that this, the gifts made to us, that we become childlike, have faith to receive them. And also, the sower can be, in today's time, any Christian, right, who has received the word, has been converted. He can share that word with others, share his, his life, uh, his Christian life with others, and that's scattering seed as well. But this word is this plan of salvation, the person of Christ himself, and as I said, it's revealed to the marriage of children, hidden from the wise and the learned, he tells us in the Gospels, hidden from the wise and the learned. I couldn't help but think of our universities, you know, that are 
seemingly uh, so secular and have the centers of great learning. And sometimes the elite of our society who have the most learning, who are the smartest guys in the room, are so hardened against a gospel message, so hardened against church teaching. These mysteries which are above us need to be, we need to become like children to receive them, to believe them, to accept them. And so Jesus uses us parables, these parables, to teach us about the kingdom. And one of the characteristics of these parables, and parables are stories of comparison, you know, speaking about these mysteries and comparing them to natural, earthly realities, experiences that we've had, one of the characteristics is that they are hidden. There's, there is something still mysterious about them. There seems to be different layers of meaning, and we can read them at different times and reflect on them and get uh, a little bit different messages. But that hiddenness that's in the parable itself, in this way of speaking, reminds us of the cross. Because Jesus' work of salvation for us, in a sense, is kind of veiled by the cross, right? This can't possibly be the plan of God, that the Messiah was just crucified and suffered for us. Isn't that complete failure? That the kingdom is, is established there on the cross and it can be hidden from, if we have a very worldly way of thinking, we don't recognize the value of Jesus' suffering and death and resurrection for us. And that's in the, the parable itself, that we have to enter into it with faith, with simplicity, to receive this teaching of Christ. John Paul II said one time that all of nature is a parable, that when we see the beauty, the wonder of creation. We can see the hand of the Creator behind that. And that if we approach it with gratitude, if we approach such beauty with gratitude and a contemplative stance with awe and silence, it can lead us to the Creator. It can lead us to God Himself and to His plan for us. Isn't it reassuring? I was up at the shrine yesterday. It's a hot day, it was a beautiful day. It was a bright, sunny day, and the clouds were out. I, I took this walk and saw a storm coming in the distance with thunder and everything. It was just a spectacular day. And there's so few moments, I think, in our modern life where we're just silent and observe. Observe this, the work of God, the, the things that come from his hand for us. And they, they nurture us and speak to us in a powerful way, these scenes of nature that comes directly from his hand for us. And if we're open to it, it can lead us to a relationship with him. Awe, wonder, respect for him, recognition of him as creator. Jesus tells us in the next verses, you know, that whoever, we don't have it today, and we have the Feast of St. Mary Magdalene coming up, so I thought I'd jump to some explanation here that we might not fully get, but it, he says, whoever has ears ought to hear. And he quotes Isaiah 6, 9, the call of the prophet. Isaiah's call is in the midst of a people that have become very hardened. They've gone after false idols. They haven't done justice to the poor. And, you know, he says these people hear, but they don't understand. They see, uh, they look, but they do not see. But he tells the disciples, they Blessed are your eyes because they see and hear these things. They have the revelation of Christ. So all this respects the freedom of the listener. Jesus isn't forcing himself on us. But we see that if we refuse his message, it does push us further away. It has a way of hardening our hearts. And that's what he's warning us against. That's what Isaiah is warned, uh, is warned about the people, you know, and their hardness of heart. And that's possible for all of us. You know, certainly we've all been these different soils. At times, you know, Satan has had his influence on us to some, to varying degrees. Or at times our hearts have been rocky ground. Or certainly we've been caught up in the thorns and weeds of the world before. That's possible for all of us. 
But there are also times in our life where we've been good soil, and that produces a superabundance, a hundredfold, that, that far outweighs the evil in our life or the poor, the times of a poorer yield, that superabundance of God working in our life. You know, that like, like these, like nature itself, it's so beautiful, it preserves our freedom, it invites us. Come and contemplate, come enjoy, come and think a little, pause and think a little. You know, it gives us freedom to enter into this relationship with Christ. It doesn't overwhelm us, it doesn't force us, but it requires an openness in us. And Pope Francis is so eloquent on this point that he says, you know, just, just be a little open. You know, in his reflections on mercy, he said, you know, God gets there first in our points of conversion and metanoia. And he said, if we can just open a little bit to God, to let him work in our life. Yes, it requires openness, but just a little to let the mercy of God get in, that we need to realize our need for him, our wretchedness. He emphasizes that point strongly, that we are wretched and that mercy has a heart for a merciful, the mercy of God has a heart for this wretchedness that reaches out to us. We have to realize our nothingness, where we come from, recognizing our sin. And he hammers away, especially, and this is very Franciscan, to recognize that we're not self-sufficient. I had a teacher in seminary, he, he told us that a lot, he said, you know, we die. We kind of forget that today. We are gonna die. <laughs> we are not, self-sufficient. We are not eternal. We can't cause and keep our own being in existence. We are inherently, intrinsically dependent. And we have to, to get that point. And, that, and he says, France, Pope Francis talks about, you know, we've fallen to sin not to just lick our wounds and stay there. But in faith, we believe there is a real medicine, a real healing in God. And that if we can just take a step towards him, if we can just open up the door a little bit to him in our life and start to experience that healing, that, that better way. You know, we had the beautiful reading this past Sunday about Martha and Mary. And Martha's told, you know, you're anxious and worried about many things. There's one thing that is necessary. Well, take that scripture and take it to prayer. Take it maybe to a church with, a, with Jesus there in the Eucharist, the real presence, and say, Jesus, you've, you've told me you're the one thing necessary. I'm worried, I'm trying to control all this stuff in my life, and I'm full of fear that all this stuff's gonna happen or not gonna go my way, or I'm not gonna get what I need or something. You, you know, tell Jesus his own words. You know, you've, you've told us that you are the one thing necessary. And be open to that, that one thing. Be open to that word coming into your life to heal, to strengthen, to guide you, that you can depend on him and not ourselves. That's, that opens us up for that yield of the 60-fold or the 100-fold. And that means that fold comes from the Holy Spirit working in our lives when we're clinging to him and not to the other things of this world or to ourselves. May we have that kind of faith and that kind of openness uh, to the Word of God.